So welcome back, everyone. Uh, let's start our second session uh, of the workshop with Jonathan Ware, uh, coming from NYU, who will discuss learning long time scale phenomena from trajectory data. So thank you very much for inviting me. And also, uh, I have to thank the earlier speakers today, because uh, what I'm talking about is, is very similar. So we're, again, going to be trying to learn committers. The data is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to be working with trajectory data. I'll explain what that means. And my goal was really to kind of explain that problem maybe to people who are, there, there will be people in the audience who are already familiar with that problem. Uh, but I hopefully will be able to explain it to folks maybe more on the ML side as an interesting uh, data analysis problem. OK, uh, long list of collaborators. They all contributed some piece of this. And so I'm, uh, I'm not going to uh -oh, separate out those. Uh -oh. <coughs> Why is that not working? It was working a second ago. Now it's working. OK. So one of the things we learned this morning was that uh, rare events are worth studying. So I'm, I'm not going to, I normally have some slides on why that's true. I'm going to skip that part. Uh, so, uh, you know, but they're, they're rare, which means they don't happen very often. So uh, we want to study them. We want to use simulation to study them or, uh, or other time series data. But we want to be able to do it with an amount of data that's short compared to the, say, the return time of the event that we're interested in. Because the assumption is that's really long. And I'm going to jump straight into a, a case study here. So I'm, I'm, we have a project in the group working on sudden, strat sudden stratospheric warmings. So that's a disruption in the, uh, in the, pull in the jet stream. Uh, and I've got a picture of sort of a normal configuration here and a disrupted configuration over here. Uh, if you, I lived in Chicago for a long time. In Chicago, the consequence of this, kind of, of, a, of an extreme version of this, is very cold weather in the winter. Uh, so, uh, okay. So, and in fact, I'm not going to really try and say anything about uh, sudden stratospheric warmings as they happen in the actual atmosphere. I'm going to drop right down to this 75-dimensional illustrative model, which we've added some stochastic forcing to. It doesn't matter so much how I get this model. I, we can talk about that. But the important thing is that you have two states, sort of like the problems that we looked at this morning. You have two states. Uh, and, and I'm interested in the transitions between the two. So in fact, A here is, is more the normal state with a strong vortex and B is the weakened vortex. There's going to be two variables that you see appearing a lot in the pictures. Uh, and you can, the interpretation that we need for the purposes of the talk is that U measures the strength of the vortex. And uh, the magnitude of this complex number psi is, uh, it measures a disruptive, the, the strength of a disruptive wave that can come and uh, disrupt the vortex, which is uh, a switch from A to B. So here I'm just showing a time series of this resulting stochastic process. So if you were to just look at this U variable, and also there's U, is, U and Psi are actually functions of altitude. Okay? But often I'm going to be plotting them just at 30 kilometers. To do the simulations, you need uh, more levels. In fact, there's 27 levels. And that's what leads to a 75-dimensional model, okay? which is, of course, microscopic compared to a real uh, weather or climate model. But it exhibits some of the features that, uh, that we're interested in. So these rare transitions, relatively rare transitions compared to the simulation scale uh, between these two states, A and B. OK, so throughout this talk, I'm going to use this model as an example. Uh, I guess one thing that's worth pointing out in comparison to some of the problems we saw this morning which also had this kind of bimodal structure, is that this is, this is far from a reversible model, OK? Far from uh, overdamp Langevin that we saw this morning. So some of the modeling assumptions that were made there, uh, including in the algorithms, 
we really can't, can't do here. Okay, so I want to compute, the goal for this talk is to compute what I would call forecast functions. And examples, one that we saw this morning quite a bit, is the committer function. So in this case, it would be the probability that the process reaches that set B, so the weakened vortex, before returning to A from some initial point x. Okay? Uh, and another one that we look at in the context of SSW is the lead time. So this is the starting from a, again from a point x, conditioned on going to B next, so conditioning, conditioned on the event going to happen, what's the time it takes to happen? So that's, that's a much shorter, a much smaller number than the return time to the event, right? The expected time for the next uh, occurrence of the event because that involves returning to A, staying at A for a while, and then eventually going to B. Instead, I want a condition on going straight to B. Okay, it, you know, uh, well, okay. So why do we want why do we why do we want these numbers? I mean, besides their the interest in just having some kind of a forecast for whether these events occur or not, which you know, if you really wanted a forecast for whether an event like this was going to happen, you would probably do numerical weather prediction, which means you start from your best guess of the current state of the weather, and you do some kind of either an ensemble simulation forward or a variational. Uh, or solve a variational problem for the, the most likely state of the weather in two weeks. Okay, if that, if that was your goal, starting from today's weather. But we actually want to look at these functions over a, a bunch of initial conditions, in which case you can't afford to do numerical weather prediction for a whole bunch of initial conditions. You do them for wherever the weather is today. We, we want to do that because we're hoping that these functions give us some insight into how... Uh, how, we, how the process does transition from A to B. So for example, maybe pointing out precursors uh, and helping us understand the physical mechanism. Okay, so that's the goal, is to compute these forecast functions. We can write these functions as conditional expectations given the current state of the system. And then you have some, in this, in this case, I've got some cost function uh, at, a, at the final time. What is the final time here? It's the escape from some domain. So I'm assuming that I'm starting in some domain. I run the process until it escapes the domain, and then I evaluate these two cost functions, a terminal cost function and a running cost function. So for example, if I take the domain to be the union of those two sets, A and B, I can write my committer probability in exactly this form. Okay, in that case, there's no H. There's just a G that's 1 on A, or 1 on B and 0 on A. Okay, so this is the goal. And uh, I want to approximate this function using trajectory data. So I, you know, one approach would be to try and build a, some kind of a reduced order model and then, uh, and then use the, the details of that model to, uh, to learn this function. Uh, another approach is to try and learn it from trajectory data. Okay, so you give me a bunch of simulations of the process x, and I'll try and back out this function. Now, if you give me a really, really long trajectory, or many trajectories run all the way until this random time t, then this is a, a standard regression problem. Not necessarily an easy regression problem, because often we don't have a lot of data. But it's a standard regression problem. In the case of the committer, uh, for each x sample, I'll have a, a 0 or a 1, which corresponds to whether the process went to b first or to a first when it went next to a or b. Okay? And then I, I can try and fit this function. Uh, that's already not such an easy task. Freddie has a nice recent paper doing that with convolutional neural networks. Uh, but that is not the goal for today. The goal for today is to try and just use short trajectories. Okay, I want to solve this problem using simulations that are no longer than some set length. So what do I have to do? Well, uh, what you can do is write down a Feynman-Katz formula for the function for the conditional expectation. This we saw a version of this at least in Masha's. Uh, talk. She gave a, a Feynman-Katz formula for the committer. That equation that, she, that was L Q equals zero. Okay. 
with a boundary condition. Uh, here's the boundary condition. For us, uh, the equation is, uh, the only reason this equation looks different and probably more cryptic is that this equation involves simulations for a finite amount of time. Not so, so the, the uh, Feynman-Katz equation that Masha showed was, was what you get from this if you take the limit as this parameter s goes to 0. Why do I want the version without that parameter s equals to 0? Well, I want to write down an equation for you for which everywhere I look, I'm simulating this x process no longer than time t. So the wedge here means min. So this is the minimum of the escape from time from t or this time s that I pick. Okay, so maybe the typical escape time is hundreds of days from a, from a point, and maybe I'm just going to use, maybe all of my simulations are going to be no longer than a day. That doesn't mean my total amount of data is going to be no longer than a day. It just means that each of the little simulations that I do are going to be a day long. Okay, of course, I am worried about my total amount of data, and so we'll address at the end, you know, whether this can actually save you in terms of total simulation time. Okay, but I'm not going to address that for a while. Uh, I just want to set up the problem. So this funny, this is a transition operator. The, the only reason there's this DC at the bottom is that it's stopped when the process reaches the boundary. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so again, everything in here requires trajectories that are no longer than the lag time s. Uh, the other point is that if I take s to infinity, I get back just the equation for u that I had on the previous slide in terms of a conditional expectation. So the methods that I show you as you take s to infinity should gracefully turn into some kind of direct regression. Okay, so that's the setup. Now, uh, now an example. Uh, so, okay, so, so this is the ugliest. I've tried to keep it completely non-technical. This is the ugliest formula. All I want, it's not that bad, but all I want you to gather from this is, or to get from this is to please compare the term in this, just one of these, just look at one of these, this term to this equation. Okay, so if you, if you interpret this, uh, if you, realize that this is a conditional expectation over a trajectory that's been evolved forward uh, some amount of time. And here we have an integral for of the over the process from 0 to t min s. If I look at the next slide, that's exactly what I've got here. Okay, The reason I have two terms is because what I really want to do is minimize the residual, the square residual. The only I mean, actually, there's a question of whether that's really what I want to do. But that's what I'm doing here. The only slight trick is that I have this transition operator, which is an expectation on the inside of the square in the square residual. And I can't just replace it by a random number. So I need to use two realizations, two trajectories, so starting from the same initial condition to get a cost function that's consistent in the sense that with lots of data, this would converge to the, to the residual the normal square residual. Okay, so I'm just minimizing the fit of my neural network solution to the equation itself. Uh, what do I need? What are the ingredients? Well, I needed a bunch of initial conditions. That's essentially also the requirement for the methods we saw this morning. They need a bunch of initial conditions. Okay, they also knew the form of the PDE. I don't want to assume that I know the form of the PDE or anything about the, uh, the generator of the process. All I have is a black box that takes a current position and spits out a new one in the future. That's the restriction. Okay, I need to, one, uh, so for this method, for this way of doing it, I need two trajectories from each point for the reason that I said. For each one of those, uh, I need to know whether it escaped uh, before this little time s. So each of those needs to be run for s units of time or until it escapes, whichever is sooner. Uh, and in the, in the pictures that I'll show you later, this is a neural network with uh, its fully connected feedforward neural network that is, uh, uh, has 10 layers and is uh, 
Uh, okay. Uh, so let me show you the. Oh, let me show you one. So that's the setup, and this is. I'm just showing you one possible way to solve this problem, this computational problem. Uh, let me show you one other point about the way we implemented things. Uh, we actually do a, uh, an adaptive sampling, again using collective variables, something we've seen this morning. The collective variables from among these 75 dimensions are u evaluated at 30 kilometers and the magnitude of psi evaluated at 30 kilometers. So that's a two-dimensional collective variable space, which we grid up. And then we look at the size of, uh, actually, we look at the contribution within a bin of these numbers, these products. Okay? The in, in other words, the integrand in the residual, in the L2 norm of the residual. Wherever, whichever bins, for whichever bins in this two-dimensional space have a large value of that uh, residual, we're going to add more samples as we train. Okay? So, I mean, I'm leaving out a lot of the details, but we train for some number of steps, some number of epoch, epochs, and then we add some more data in this way, meaning we go look at the residual contribution in each bin. We sample bins to add more a, a fixed amount more data, and then we continue on with our training. Okay? Uh, this, has, this particular procedure has no justification for the neural network. It does have a justification for another scheme that I'll mention in a second. I mean, you can say that this is a sensible way to add new data. What we can say for the neural network approach is that it does add data in a place that seems physically reasonable. So if you remember the discussions of committers this morning, this is the committer, uh, this, the committer here is zero. Uh, well, I guess I've got it turned around. Uh, the committer here should be, is one, I guess, near A. So this is the probability of hitting A before B. The committer here is one. And the committer here is zero, and this is the transition region in between. This is where the gradient of the committer is large. It's sort of where you'd expect to want to do more sampling, want to need more sampling. So it's sensible, but like I said, there's no uh, justification for the, the uh, neural network version of this. This is the agreement. So this is a, a simple model. We can run it for a really, really long time, bin up these two dimensions, and just compute what's the average, what's the fraction of, for, the, for all the trajectories in starting in a little box in this two-dimensional space, what's the fraction of them that hit A before B? And that gives me an estimate uh, of the committer, which I can compare to, yeah? So we, you explain this already, but can you explain uh, uh, once more what is the connection between uh, the observable C, F, and G? Yeah, so, uh, so this, is, this is just our cost function that we minimize. Yeah. Okay, and it's, it, you know, I, I was trying to argue that it looks like the L2 residual. It's, in fact, what you get if you had a lot of data. Okay, so what I do to adjust the sampling. It's the L2 residual of what? The, it's, uh, if I had lots and lots of data, this would give me, uh, uh, u minus t minus integral, uh, so expectation over x <coughs> minus the integral h x t up to t. Uh, so, well, the actual equation that, uh, that u solves. The residual for that equation, uh, the two norm of that, against a sampling measure that I haven't specified. So this is a norm in a weighted, this is a weighted norm. This, the measure for this norm would be whatever measure you're drawing the initial conditions from. Okay, which for us is a little weird because we're drawing them adaptively. Does that make sense? And so what I do is I look at basically an estimate of the inside here for each of these, these sets that I make out of this two-dimensional space. So I bin this two-dimensional space, okay, meaning that I'm really binning the whole space, but I'm binning just using the two-dimensional space. I take all the samples that are in uh, 
in one of these bins, and I compute an estimate of the, the contribution of, of the number on the inside, an average of the number on the inside here. So it's like a contribution from that bin to the total residual. If I summed over all the bins, I'd get the total residual, the total cost function. OK? So yeah, the idea is just to say this cost function in some way is a sum over contributions from each bin. I'll add more samples in a bin according to whether the contribution is large or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, sorry, I'm intentionally leaving details out, but I'm sure I, to make it easier to follow, but I'm sure I overshot in places. Uh, so I'm showing the, the error against just an empirical committer computed from lots of simulation, and you see that it's quite good. I'm not showing you the one from the, uh, from the um, lead time, but uh, it's, it's, and it's, it's not as good, I should say. The error bars, we show error bars over multiple trainings, and it's, they're, they're worse, uh, at least on, on the right. But uh, OK, this is the idea. And I, I want to point out that there, is, there has uh, this adaptive sampling idea. The particular way we're doing it, we're solving a different problem. We're not solving a PDE that we know. We're doing this trajectory data analysis problem. We are solving for the committer. Uh, but the, the particular way they do the adaptivity is different here, but, but they are doing um, some adaptive sampling in the sense that they're using their current estimate of the committer or their, what they've currently learned to decide where to sample next. OK, so let me mention, where am I on time? OK, so let me mention uh, an al some alternative methods. The most famous of those would be, or at least for MD folks, would be Markov state models. There's a, here's a picture here. In this picture, I've discretized time as well, which uh, you wouldn't need to do for this model. But in that, uh, in Mar Markov state model, you partition the, the state space in some way, and you just compute the number of transitions between different boxes. We saw this mentioned earlier today as a coarse graining approach. It was traditionally thought of as a modeling approach. You build this object. This is now your model. You go ask questions about the model. Uh, you can also interpret this as, as just a, uh, as a basis expansion for the feynman katz equation. So you, you could interpret the committer you would compute from that model as actually uh, an approximation coming from a Galerkin expansion of the, a basis expansion of the feynman katz equation. Uh, there's other basis, bases that you can use. In fact, we've tried uh, diffusion maps basis for the same problem. Uh, and these methods, they, the, when the basis is chosen well, the Galerkin approach is pretty hard to beat in the, when you have limited data. I mean, we've found it hard to, to uh, you know, the neural network will not beat for us a well-chosen basis. Now, what does it take to choose a basis well? Well, it takes some understanding of the problem, okay? So it's a little bit less black, quite a bit less black box, actually. And I should also point out that Galerkin schemes for eigenproblems, uh, those of using trajectory data, so exactly the same setup, but looking at eigenproblems, those go back at least to the 80s. So, so there's a lot of work in this general problem of how do you learn something about the process from trajectory data that's you know, probably before I was born. Uh, but uh, you know, our focus is really specifically on uh, these conditional expectations. That has an advantage both for, I think, designing methods, but it also has an advantage for trying to answer some of these uh, design questions. So there's some obvious questions. How should I choose the initial conditions? We've seen this addressed a little bit, for example, in Masha's talk. Uh, how should I choose the time lag? Uh, and how should I choose the spatial resolution? Uh, this one is definitely murky if you're talking about a neural network, but is, is more clear if you're talking about something like a Markov state model where I partitioned space. Uh, and built a basis. OK, I will just run quickly through some answers to these questions. Returning to this overdamp Langevin equation, which we've seen before, here it's a triple well potential. So this process likes to hang out in the, actually, this is probably, this is probably the invariant distribution, so e to the minus beta v. So it likes to hang out near these modes and make rare transitions between them. The committer for this process, if I'm asking about going from 
uh, zero, the transition from, so A is everything left of zero and, and B is everything right of one. The committer is going to look like this. Why does it look like a, step, like, step, like a step function? Well, if I start in any one of these high probability regions, I equilibrate before I escape. So where I start in the region doesn't really affect the committer, which is why you see it looks like a step function. Okay, for the algorithm, what happens is the positions of these steps are very hard to estimate. Uh, let me, s okay, I, I want to finish up. There's different kinds of error, error. I think that's probably pretty clear. One is just how well uh, your chosen approximation class can, appro can, can uh, represent the function, the true solution to the equation. And another is estimation error, which is that when I actually go solve this equation, I'm using trajectory data and a finite amount of it. So what's the effect of, of, of the sampling error? Uh, I'll just mention a few conclusions for sampling error. One is related to the question of how should you choose the initial conditions for the trajectory. Uh, if you actually choose them like e to the minus beta v, then basically there's no lag time at which these algorithms are going to work. Oh, I should have mentioned what I'm showing you is for an MSM. This is a one-dimensional process. So I've built an MSM where I just discretize <coughs> that one dimension and compute, you know, count the number of trajectories between the bins. Okay, so, uh, but if you, for example, draw the initial conditions uniformly, you see a very di different picture, including some interesting behavior with the lag time. And if you're interested in something like the relative error in the committer, then you'll see that actually it's an intermediate lag time that is the best possible choice. Uh, so you can see that in simulation. You might also care about that if you're worried about these simulating trajectories of this length which is sort of a silly length. You're not going to simulate trajectories that long. Uh, so uh, the upshot is you know, we, can we can explain what happens here. With we have some bounds that actually reproduce this behavior. And we can explain what, what, uh, what's going on in these, this intermediate time lag regime. It's basically the regime where you've picked the time lag so that the transitions between and the resolution so that transitions between neighboring bins happen relatively frequently. They're not super rare events that don't involve really small probabilities. If you wait too long, you'll fall all the way down to the, to the bottoms of these basins. And, you're, uh, and if you go too short, you'll stay within, within, your wherever you, within the bin that you started in. So, uh, so anyways, we, I'm not showing them. We have error bounds that explain this behavior uh, and give you an idea of how one should tune the, the lag time uh, for these problems as they get, as you make them harder. OK, uh, and that's just the resulting Markov state matrix. So uh, that's everything. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was wondering, you said like based on the on the cost function, you will uh, in depending on the beans, you would add uh, more samples. Uh, do you just add the samples to the data set and keep previous samples, or do you uh, remove discard samples for the one you've just added? Yeah. So there's a couple of things that I should have said, which is that first of all, you can't just throw new points into these bins because they won't be. They won't be physical. You have to choose the rest of the coordinates sensibly, right? So the way we actually generate new points is by simulating from some of our old points, running the process, and but keeping it in the bin. Uh, but sorry, but making sure we sample when it's still in the bin. Uh, the the total data set is accumulated, though. Okay. So yeah, you you don't discard any 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 data. Okay. Yeah. And and there is another thing that I'm not sure I quite understood is. How you describe, like you said you wanted to, to train on shorter trajectories. Mm -hmm. um, is there any way to know what is the, the, best uh, the best strategy to train? Let's say you, you have the same computational budget and to train on long trajectories that maybe will exhibit uh, the different phenomena or to train on more trajectories but shorter. Do we have any idea or what is the best for the, the training? So I think for, for the Markov state model, you can make some pretty precise statements. OK. So, so uh, and, and we have bounds that do that. For the neural network, I think the best approach, so first I should say we have no 
theoretical statement. What do we do in practice? We do some kind of cross-validation because we typically would have longer trajectories that we're selecting from. And so we can kind of slide that choice and see where the error seems to be lowest. Okay. There, there is one major weakness in the scheme that I showed you, this two trajectory requirement. Uh, we actually, we've, uh, in the paper that I contributed for discussion, we, uh, that data set has uh, multiple trajectories launched from every initial condition, and so it's fine. But if I was <coughs> using some other observation, satellite observations or something, I mean, I don't get two realizations per data point. So you can think of things like adversarial schemes, which we've thought of, but uh, it's actually making them really work well is tricky. Thank you. Thank you. And there's a question. So in the Feynman Katz formula, what is the term G? How do you define it? So G for, let me, can I do it with an example? So G, if you were doing the committer, if you were solving the committer, it's some cost. I mean, you're, what it is might depend on the application, what was the right thing to consider. Uh, but if you're thinking of the committer, you, G, H would be zero, mm -hmm. and G would be, so D is the union of A and B, H would be zero, but then there is zero integral. Yeah, but that's that's what you get for the committer, right? There's this term still. Uh huh. So the ah yeah, and G would be probability. Yeah. G would be one or zero. Ah yes. One if I'm in. Mm -hmm. I, I think I got my A's and B's mixed up at some point in the talk. Mm -hmm. But let's say one if I'm in A and zero if I'm in B. In B. Okay. Yeah, I guess uh, a, a, so I should have said that A union, A union B is the complement of D. I probably said that wrong. How did you choose initial conditions in the example that uh, Weber? Yeah, so in this, in this particular example, we did, well, so, so I, I'm not going to call this model weather, but uh, <laughs> in this particular example, we took a really long simulation and drew points. And it was important that the way we drew points was, uh, you know, not just every 10 days or something. We drew points so that we uh, more or less uniformly sampled the U variable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that means selecting more, um, you know, making, discretizing U and making sure we're selecting about the same amount for each set of U values. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Um, one of the underlying assumptions, I guess, is always that there are no strong memory effects. Uh, what do you do if there would be? Yeah, so again, I was trying to strip this down to a point where, uh, where I thought people would, where it would sort of make sense to anybody, but we always do this with delay embeddings or other explicit ways of uh, including memory, basically. It, it makes a huge difference for the approximation quality. So even if you avoid sampling, okay, your approximation quality is going to be much better when you have uh, delay embeddings. In fact, it adds some statistical variation, but we find that, I mean, for, for all of these problems, we use delay embeddings. Thank you very much. Last question, maybe? OK, if not, let's thank John again.
Okay, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, so I'll talk today a little bit about some recent work we've done on weighted ensemble. So the team from math, you might recognize some of these faces. Uh, Rob is on the left there. At top is a student of John, a former student of John. And uh, Gideon, I think some of you know, is top middle. This is Dan Zuckerman. And the three folks on bottom are some of Dan's current and former students. Sorry. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> Okay, so anyway, here's the team, um, and yeah, we've, we've had a lot of fun trying to figure out uh, what's going on, basically. And I'm sorry, I'm, the jet lag is starting to kick in, so uh, I might sort of go in and out of lucidity here. Okay, so what is weighted ensemble? It's a splitting and merging method, or splitting and killing method, where you have an ensemble of trajectories, and each one is following an under underlying dynamical law, and at periods of time tau, um, some of the trajectories are killed and some of them are copied. And the, here the trajectory weight is represented by the width of these segments, okay? So each trajectory carries a weight, which accounts for its importance. And you can see here that we can imagine that this uh, trajectory was merged with this one and this one that inter inherited the weight of that one. And likewise here, this one was merged with that one, and it inherited its weight uh, in the same kind of manner. Okay. So, um, why weighted ensemble? So, weighted ensemble can access uh, long time scales. So, if we want to go, for example, from a uh, unbound state to a bound state in some kind of protein, uh, we could uh, use, you know, survival, uh, survival of the fittest, some kind of splitting and killing in order to, to go there. And um, this might be a little optimistic, but uh, in some recent work by Lotz and Dixon, uh, they found that they could go from basically A to B in 42 seconds instead of 11 minutes. Okay. Um, so, the, you know, the problem is not solved, so there's a lot more work to do. Um, one of the issues is that Although you can get from A to B, um, you may uh, not accurately capture, the, for example, the time that it ought to take to go from A to B. You might not ac accurately capture the flux uh, in that direction. So getting converged estimates of, of quantities that, that you're interested in is still an issue. So weighted ensemble can get you. You can split and kill to get places you want to go, but that doesn't necessarily give you the right information about uh, the process you're, you're interested in. So the, the question uh, that I have for you today, and this is similar to what Pierre asked this morning, is, you know, are we doing the right thing here? We sort of have an uh, adaptive procedure for uh, figuring out how to run weighted ensemble, and it, it goes through a cycle where we run some short, short trajectories, 
uh, because that's all we can afford. And then we update some progress coordinates and then just kind of repeat that process. Um, we also want to do that in a principled way. <coughs> principled way. We have some uh, mathematical theory and we kind of want to integrate it into that workflow. So why uh, use WE? Um, so here's a little uh, sales pitch. Um, there's three reasons here that are kind of unique. Um, it's an unbiased method, so what I mean here is that I have a finite ensemble of walkers. I'm not changing the dynamics, and it's basically just free sampling these, these walkers. And there's no finite particle bias. There's no bias from changing dynamics. Okay. Uh, there, there can be some bias from failing to reach equilibrium, but we'll talk about that. Uh, it's ergodic, so I can take time averages of an ensemble of walkers, and things are all, all good and kosher with that. And I can also handle um, non-equilibrium, so I don't need an assumption of, I don't know why it keeps doing that. Uh, I don't need an assumption that uh, we're sampling equilibrium or that we have reversibility. I don't know that's needed here. And I think, uh, as far as we can tell, uh, this is the only important sampling method that has these three properties combined. As far as the implementation, um, it has the advantage that you can control the weights, and as a result, you can control uh, how unphysical the, uh, the paths become. So, for example, if you're doing regular important sampling, you're changing dynamics, uh, it's well known that the weights tend to get degenerate after a long time. Um, in weighted ensemble, it's quite easy to control uh, how bad the weights can get. It's easy to implement. Basically, you have a black box integrator, you run trajectories for time tau, and um, that's paralyzable. And uh, the only uh, intervention you need is just resampling it at these tau intervals. Um, it's quite flexible in that you can uh, basically upsample as you please, although we have a, a more structured uh, version of it that we'll talk about here. So we have uh, some theory that, that tells us how to do things in an optimal way. And and here's some of the, the story of that. OK, so the, the quantity that we're really interested in is a mean first passage time from A to B. In this picture, uh, A is minus 1, and B is, a, is plus 1. And you see that uh, the, the first passage time that's pictured here is quite long. Uh, of course, this is just a toy model, but it's a, the basic idea. And the way that we're going to compute it is not from directly observing a transition from minus 1 to 1, but instead from uh, considering a, a process with a sink at 1 and a source at minus 1 and just letting that run into its steady state. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about. Steady state flux A to B is for a, a dynamics that recycles from B to A. Mathematically, what we have is an ergodic Markov chain, uh, which we're assuming is time discrete. That's not so important. And um, we are interested in the mean first passage time to B. Let's let tau sub B be the first passage time. Uh, rho A is an initial distribution in A, and it's also what we recycle to uh, when we reach B. So again, B, B goes back to rho A. Uh, that's stated in the following condition. If I start from x and look at the next time step, that's as if I started from row A whenever I'm in B. Uh, basic renewal theorem from probably gives you the, the equation that I showed on the last slide. This is just a little bit more precise. So the, the point of this is that we have on the, on the left a long time problem of observing uh, first passage times. And now it's converted into a, a different problem, which appears to be long time. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. It's not quite as bad, but it's a, it's a rare event problem because this probability will be small when this mean for special time is large. Um, so here's a toy example just to kind of see, get a feel for what, what's going on. So here we have three states, one, two, and three, uh, represented by rows in a, in a transition matrix. And this is a markup chain where it's difficult to get from 1 to 3. Okay. And the, the second eigenvalue is 1 minus delta. If we introduce recycling from 3 to 1, as I described in the last slide, then that gets rid of the, uh, the slow time scale, basically. 
And, um, and so I really do uh, remove the, the metastability issue in my sampling, and all that's left is a, a, a rare event issue where I have to import and sample this small probability, okay, the, the steady state probability to be in state three. And the mean first passage time is given by this, this formula again, is that the mean first passage time is the inverse of this probability, in this case, uh, one over delta squared, roughly. Okay, so it's not always that nice, but at least by introducing recycling in this way, we can sometimes get rid of uh, some of the slow time scales. So how does the, the method work? So weighted ensemble is really just dynamics plus a, a kind of resampling. Dynamics is just that walkers are going to evolve according to whatever law they have. We're not going to change that. Resampling means that walkers are uh, divided into bins and then just resampled according to their weights. And in this picture here, there's three bins and uh, these red X's are walkers that were not resampled and the, the black circles are walkers that were resampled and the, the, the black circles are picked by sampling according to weight. In a little bit more precise notation, let's, let's call the walkers psi and the weights w. Uh, the dynamic step is just evolving the underlying uh, dynamics for a time tau. The, and that, that, that's done independently through the walkers. Resampling is, uh, looks a little more complex, but again, it's just sampling <coughs> according to weight. So in each bin, I sample according to the weights in that bin. And then the, the weights that are assigned after resampling are just uniform within each bin, and they're just equal to uh, the, the bin weight divided by the, the number of walkers that I request in the bin. So this is pretty standard, just resampling, bin, bin resampling. And based on that, you can uh, see that things are not biased in the sense that uh, the expectation of my ensemble on a function f is the same as the expectation of my underlying process um, on the same function at the right lag time. Okay, so how do we, uh, how do we choose the, the best parameters? So this is what the math is going to inform. So we need some states. We're talking about going A to B. We need to pick an initial di distribution within A. Uh, we need to figure out how we're going to divide walkers into bins for the resampling, and we're going to have to figure out how many walkers we want per bin. Uh, there's also a question of the, the lag time for the underlying dynamics. So we'll think of the states as just given by practitioner. The initial distribution is not all that uh, problematic in WE, um, in the sense that once it's given, it doesn't really matter how it's sampled. Um, the, the bins and the number of walkers that we want in each bin are very important, so we'll talk about that. As far as the lag time, we can sort of just shrink it to improve results. Of course, we have to pay for that with the extra um, communication cost. So the, the theory shows us how to best choose the bins and what I'm calling the allocation. So the theory uh, is based on three quantities. One is pi, which is what I'm calling the, uh, the non-equilibrium steady state uh, of my underlying dynamics. And there is also the mean first passage time, which we are interested in. M is the mean first passage time as a function of the point x. And the, th the last ingredient is the variance of the, the mean first passage time function at uh, lag tau. Um, so, we find that we do well binning based on M, and I'll have a theorem for you in a couple minutes. Um, the optimal uh, allocation of, of walkers is pi times V, okay? So these three ingredients tell us um, how to do a good job. Um, here's a 2D toy model that sort of illustrates why this might matter. Um, so here is a landscape where row A is this red dot right here. We're gonna, this is our starting point, and we're interested in the time it takes to get to this red square up on the top middle. And um, you know, typical methods uh, uh, often assume taking radial bins or RMSD bins uh, to the target, um, which would encourage, I guess, a direct transition. 
if you take a direct path from here to here, you, you basically, uh, that, that's a almost zero probability uh, event. So that's not the right uh, thing to be sampling. The physical transition, uh, which is the overwhelmingly likely one, is to go around the, the bottom right and come up that way. Um, so the bins that we get from optimizing look like this. Each different color is a different bin. And this is based on a very refined estimate of, of those quantities I mentioned in the last slide. Uh, the optimal allocation distribution is, is over here. And I think this is a log. But it sort of uh, matches a little bit the, the bins. OK. So the theory says that if we have enough walkers and bins in the two-dimensional space of the MFPT function and the variance of the MFPT, uh, and if we allocate the right way, then we can get the lowest possible variance. And the, the proof is not that complex. Basically, you uh, separate the variance into uh, terms that associated with evolution and resampling. It's a Martin de Martingale comp decomposition. You uh, look at the term for resampling, and it's small if you have enough bins. It's not too surprising. And the evolution part is minimized when uh, the allocation follows a certain formula in terms of the MFPT variance, V. And that expression uh, approaches the, the pi times V that I mentioned uh, in, in an asymptotic limit. The theoretical maximum variance you can uh, reduce by is, is this formula here. Uh, so, you know, in practice, you'll have a, a V function that is very, uh, uh, ver very variable. So in certain regions will be re really large, certain regions will be very small, and this will be a large uh, quantity in, in complex problems. Um, what do we do in practice? So we, we obviously cannot afford a, a ton of um, walkers and a ton of bins um, in complex models. So what we do is we choose bins in mean first passage time space according to this M function, where the bin boundaries are just uh, level sets of the MFPT function. And we choose those level sets so that we evenly divide up the mass of this pi v, which is our optimal allocation distribution. And then we allocate the same number of walkers for every bin. And this seems to beat everything when we have good estimates of the steady state of the MFPT function and the variance of the MFPT, in the sense that we just can't find anything else that beats it in that case, um, including like methods that, that adapt to binning and allocation to uh, the current ensemble. That, that just isn't working better, which we found a little bit surprising. So in this example, we uh, tried things out. Again, the, the red dot here is, is, the, is state A, and the, the blue square up here is state B. And what we found was that if we use um, radial bins, or this is really RMSD bins, we actually did quite horribly, um, worse even than direct Monte Carlo. And the, the reason is that we're encouraging the wrong kind of transition. So even though we get a non-zero flux, it's the completely, completely wrong value. If we use our optimized method, we can get within like an order of magnitude of the, uh, the theoretical minimum variance. Of course, it's just a 2D uh, toy model. Um, one thing that we can see on the, the right here is that this result is pretty robust to the number of particles, although, again, we're, we're uh, in a very simple toy model. So what are we doing in real problems? Uh, so we have a, a pipeline which is just starting to go uh, up. And uh, basically, it's a sequence where we run weighted ensemble. We have to do some dimension reduction. We build a Markov state model. Uh, the Markov state model tells us what are these functions, the uh, m, the pi, and the v. Um, 
And that gives us an optimal binning and an optimal allocation. And based on that, we can sort of cycle through again. And this is the, the step where we're not sure, you know, what should we really be doing because uh, maybe there's a way to kind of circumvent all the, uh, maybe these two steps and just handle it all with some kind of machine learning. Um, we have some initial results. Um, these are for what we're calling reference optimization. And reference optimization means that we have pretty good estimates of the quantities we need to optimize. And in that case, uh, I'm speaking of the m, the v, and the, and the, and the pi. In this case, we get uh, pretty good results. So once we apply optimization, we get uh, much less variance in the flux. And you can see that the uh, y scale here is log. So it's, it's quite a large difference here. Each uh, different red curve, I think, is a different uh, simulation. OK, so that looks quite good. The, the problem is that, um, again, that was using a reference optimization where we knew pretty well the quantities we needed to optimize at the beginning. And uh, in practice, we want to do that adaptively. And we don't really know how to do that yet. As you see, if we estimate the, these quantities on the fly, then we are getting um, bins that are really more reflective of root mean squared distance rather than of uh, a good progress coordinates like the committer or, or the MFPT. Yeah? Yeah, so this is actually, a, it's not really trip cage, it's a very refined uh, discrete model for trip cage okay. with 10,000 states. Yeah, yeah, we can just do it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so we, we don't know how to do it on the fly yet. So that's something that we'd like to hopefully learn here this week. Um, there's also some questions I have about um, are there other ways we can go about binning that don't rely on complex quantities. Can we bin based on time since last in A, that's kind of principled. Um, can we uh, bend based on other things like uh, maintaining a, a constant weighted forward flux? I think that's also kind of principled. Um, and there's various ideas of this, this uh, in this class that I think we need to explore. OK, so just wrapping up, what are the advantages and disadvantages of, of weighted ensemble advantages include uh, that it's unbiased at a finite number of walkers. It is not so sensitive to the initial distribution that we're using to compute first passage times. We can use as many coordinates as we want for binning, although the theory says that we really only need two. Uh, simple to implement. You can just use like a black box integrator, and then all you're doing is resampling. And it's more accurate than MSMs and some other non-equilibrium methods. What's missing is some kind of natural adaptivity. Um, so we'd really like to, uh, it'd be great if we could have a version of it which doesn't rely on computing these complex quantities like the, the MFPT function, uh, at least uh, beforehand. It's more expensive than MSMs, and it requires some interventions in complex problems to uh, get rid of uh, initialization bias. Okay, that's it. Okay. <laughs> uh, very nice talk, thanks. Um, I, I have a, a couple of questions, uh, and uh, just for my understanding, so why you say that you need two reaction coordinates for binning? I mean, yeah, so the one is enough, no? Yeah, and that's what we use. Um, the theory says that we can get the, the literal lowest possible variance if we bin in the MFPT, the M, and the variance of the MFPT, that's the V. So right. is it, is it uh, easy to understand, or is this, uh, is this a whole, uh, a whole, it is this a whole uh, it talk by itself? 
<laughs> Pro probably another talk. It's right. not okay. that bad if you just okay. look at the variance formulas. Okay. Then it's not so hard to, to see what's going on. Yeah, so my, my, nec my other question related to this is uh, if you use, instead of the MFPT, uh, which might seem natural, uh, uh, the commitment probability or the uh, committer, could that also be used? In <sighs> the it, it, it can. It can be bad in some cases. It's not, it's not the right coordinate for okay. this. All right, now that would be uh, interesting to discuss these. Yeah, I mean, I can show you some plots. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Yes. This has to do with the cost you pay for integrating the answer. I have another question. <laughs> that, put that on his bill. Yeah. Uh, uh, what was my. Oh, you said that the that resampling more frequently shouldn't uh, cause problems. I'm as surprised. long as you're not uh, doing it wrong. Okay, I would. I'd be worried about. If, let's say I have a diffusion or something. I'd be worried about frequent transitions. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. So you'd have to make some assumptions there. Okay. Um, but like, yeah, if you have a Just some momentum. E and every resampling, I lose some diversity. So it's a race between mixing exactly, and diversity. Exactly. So, yeah, ideally you would have a, if you had a case where you had a fixed, fixed bins, let's say, and you had some momentum, then, you know, if you have, if you're letting the, the tau go to zero, then you're okay as long as you're not resampling okay. uh, when you don't need to. Okay. So on when you choose the bad, in some sense, reaction coordinate, bad binning. So in principle, I mean, in a, in a very long time, you should still converge to the right, to the right, uh, to the right. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, so the result right. isn't biased, but it's just yes, the variance that is. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so, okay. And, and, and another question was, so if you use purely deterministic dynamics, so only noise in the initial conditions, in principle, you can use what you are. Yeah, you can still do it. In principle, you could use. Oh, I don't know about the theory. Uh, you can still use WE for sure. Yeah. Um, How much noise do you need? I mean, uh, where on along the path? Because it's something we in AMS that we <laughs> are struggli struggling with a little bit. And I yeah, so things will change for sure because your V function in that case would be zero. Um, this is something we have not uh, thought about. More questions? If not, I have one, <laughs> which is a, a naive question for the non-experts in the audience. So, um, okay, I wasn't aware about sampling uh, those weighting ensembles and uh, the, the binning and, and so on and so forth. But I was aware of, for example, iterative important sampling or sampling, important resampling, which seems to be related somehow because based on where you are, you compute a weight and you decide if you replicate or if you kill the particles. Sure. And, and I'm wondering if here you cannot do something like this because maybe it's irreversible, so you cannot wait, compute weights, so you compute bins. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious about the link between those methods. Yeah, so th there's a close relation there. You could certainly do that. Uh, the, the, the nice thing about weighted ensemble is it's, it's the only method like that that that's both consistent at long times and doesn't have any finite particle number bias. I see. Which, which uh, important sampling has as, uh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, uh, I have another question, which might also be very basic. But the, uh, so you do binning in the MFPT, but because uh, MFPT is one of the final uh, yes. Outcomes of the uh, right. Uh, it seems like a, like a chicken and egg problem. Yeah, so how, course, do you how do you but solve? That, but it's it's that way in an in important sampling, just generally. You know, the optimal important sampling distribution is what you need to compute. So the the idea is just to get a rough estimate of of that function and then use that to inform your your sampling, and, you and then repeat. Iterative. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Right. Okay. Thanks. Do we have any more questions? No? If not, let, let's thank David again.
Okay, so it's an unusual conference where we are ahead of time. So, <laughs> so we have either a 45 minutes uh, coffee break or we actually move the schedule uh, forward by 15 minutes. What do you think, Tony? Stay on. Let's stick to the... So
do you say? Polois, right? Full house. Full house. That's all right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Are we good to go? Okay. So welcome back to the last session of the day. Um, and we are welcoming Peter Bolois now, that who is going to talk about learning the reaction coordinates for activated processes in complex molecular systems. Please. All right. Uh, thanks for uh, the introduction and also thanks for the invitation to this uh, already very nice workshop. Uh, so <coughs> I'm going to touch upon uh, many issues that have already been uh, uh, discussed. Uh, so we try to understand uh, uh, rare events in uh, complex molecular systems and we use things like uh, trajectory sampling, committer uh, uh, the function concepts, uh, and also uh, machine learning, obviously. All right, just to uh, um, repeat what you, everyone knows already very quickly. So here's a, a typical rare event where we have two metastable states, A and B, and there's a large free energy barrier. This is usually higher than, uh, than KBT. And so typically, as a function of time, this system has behavior like this telegraph uh, plot that stays for a long time in A and then occasionally jumps. But uh, uh, the time it takes to actually undergo this transition is extremely short compared to the uh, residence times. This is, of course, the well-known problem. Uh, and so um, you could, uh, in principle, try to find out a transition state using uh, and actually apply transition state theory, but that is actually not so helpful in very high dimensional systems. And usually people use enhanced sampling techniques like we heard already before. Um, of course, the, the, uh, in our field at least, uh, the typical um, method is umbrella sampling. Yeah, this is the prototypical <coughs> method, but also metadynamics and many, many others. I don't, uh, I'm not going to list them, but they uh, are usually require a good reaction coordinate. And uh, uh, <coughs> it typically we use a collective variable for a reaction coordinate, but you have to be very careful. And here is the famous picture that uh, people have been drawing on the blackboard uh, many times. If we know about a certain uh, CV that we are trying to apply to our system, uh, and you have also all kinds of other degrees that you maybe not know about, then if you s uh, start over here in A and you want to push to, to B, and you push along here, then obviously you end in this white region, which is a very high barrier, and actually it's not the right uh, mechanism that the, the system would like to take. So this is what I would call a wrong or an incorrect uh, reaction coordinate. What, of course, the system should like to do is actually go like this and actually uh, visit this, this transition state region. Uh, and, uh, and this would be a typical uh, picture of a correct reaction coordinate. And now you can immediately see what the difference is between reaction coordinate and, uh, and, and uh, a CV. Uh, one is just a variable and the other one is really provi uh, providing you a progress variable for the, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, the, the, the process at hand. Now, what uh, are we now, uh, can we do to solve this problem? How do you get this correct uh, CV or this correct RC, I should say? You focus on the actual transition paths because there is the information that actually uh, contains this, uh, this correct uh, RC. And to do that, uh, we want to only, uh, we want to avoid all this uh, residence. Uh, so this long time that you spend in one of the stable states, we should avoid. And we only focus on these short transition paths. Now to do that, you can take uh, trajectory-based sampling between a reacted and a product state because it, it requires no, uh, uh, no, pre no predefined reaction coordinate. Well, that again, the prototypical Example of this is things like uh, notch elastic band, but also uh, uh, other methods like uh, milestoning or the string method uh, falls into this uh, uh, regime. We also heard about the, uh, the weighted ensemble, which I also would uh, uh, sh uh, put in this category. But I'm going to talk about uh, uh, transition path sampling, which actually indeed focuses on these very short paths and samples them with a Monte Carlo move. So just to uh, remind you, so what we actually do, uh, if we start with an initial pathway, this is this, uh, this white one, and then we sh uh, select one particular uh, point from that, and we create a new uh, pathway, a new trajectory from this point by integrating the equations of motions, but then uh, uh, in a forward and in the backward dire direction until they <coughs> actually uh, reach a stable state, and then we accept or reject according to the... Um, 
uh, Metropolis Hastings uh, uh, criterion. Now, this, uh, of course, this is an, uh, an old method. Eh? This has been around for a while, but it yields mechanisms, uh, path ensembles, and in principle, it contains also information on reaction coordinates, uh, rate constants, and eventually also uh, free energies. And this is actually uh, part of the philosophy. Uh, so we first start with the path ensembles, then from the path ensembles you try to extract some uh, mechanisms. Uh, uh, eventually you can also do kinetics, and uh, maybe at, a, at the end of the story you get a uh, complete free energy uh, landscape. Now the uh, path ensemble algorithms gives an exponential speed up with respect to the rare event time scale, uh, uh, just because these um, yeah, the, the, the time uh, of a, an event, uh, the mean for special time, scales exponentially with the, the barrier height. Uh, there are now quite a few uh, software packages that you might check out. Uh, just as an uh, uh, ads advertisement slide here, so we have, this is kind of uh, a, a rough selection of uh, what has been done in the, in the past. Uh, so from chemical reactions, uh, glasses, uh, enzymes, lipid membranes, crystal nucleation, and uh, protein folding, etc. Now, this is uh, uh, the method I'm going to use, but I want to focus on this reaction coordinate problem. Now, in my opinion, there are two um, main reasons to actually have a good reaction coordinate. One is what we already have heard before, that you actually want to improve sampling so you can explore. Uh, uh, configuration space, establish metastable states and sample dynamical transitions uh, between these states. And then uh, by analyzing uh, this data, you optimize a collective variable to uh, be as close as possible to the true reaction coordinate as possible. And indeed, there th this is aim number one. But we also would like to actually make uh, predictions. And this actually leads to physical insight in what is actually uh, it, well, what is a, a, a system property or a property of the process you're uh, interested in. Now, these are, of course, not mutually exclusive, but they are two aims that we would like to uh, address. Now, um, there have been many, um, many uh, attempts in the past to actually uh, uh, address this problem. Uh, so here is an a, 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 a incomplete list of uh, all the different uh, approaches. Some of them are based on snapshots, on configurations of the, of the system, uh, like uh, SVD and PCA, uh, more recently linear discriminant analysis, but you can also think of low dimensional maps uh, like sketch map and ISO maps and diffusion maps that we heard this morning. Uh, you can also think of outer encoders uh, to optimize latent spaces, um, uh, and that actually ha has uh, uh, been recently uh, initiate or like uh, uh, done by, for example, the Ferguson Group uh, and also by uh, Patrice Tibari and also here by uh, Maccabi and Stoltz. Uh, then we also have uh, trajectory-based uh, uh, or uh, time-based methods. For example, uh, VAMP maps use time-lagged independent component analysis, uh, no, also known as TICA. Uh, the Fabulous method by Ensing et al. actually uses uh, neural nets and genetic algorithms. The S-Goop or SCOOP uh, optimizes a spectral gap. We, of course, have already heard about nonlinear strings from Van den Einde, path CVs, and neural, uh, neural net-based path CV that, uh, that Utah used in, in her uh, approach. I'm going to talk about committer-based um, methods to find out reaction coordinates, and uh, most uh, importantly, the likelihood maximization uh, and uh, the Bayesian approach uh, uh, and symbolic regression that I'm going to introduce at the end. So just to remind you uh, what uh, a transition, uh, sorry, a committer is. I mean, uh, the word committer have been, has been uh, used already quite a bit. Uh, so I'll reintroduce it here. Uh, the, uh, the committer uh, PB of a certain state, a certain configuration point in the phase space or configuration space X, is the probability that the trajectory initiated from this configuration relaxes into the final state. So if you start over here, you reinitialize your, your trajectory with uh, random velocities or uh, just uh, uh, a, random noise, uh, a random noise or a random number generator, then uh, you can measure this probability. And uh, if uh, this happens to be 0.5, then you are at a transition state, so you have equal 
probability to go forward or backward. Now, for many pathways, you can actually identify a whole ensemble of these uh, points, and this is known as the transition state ensemble, which is an intersection of the transition pathways with the P1 half surface. This is the, uh, the, yeah, the dividing surface just between A and B. And of course, you can actually uh, imagine a foliation of these transition state ensembles or committer isosurfaces, or isocommitter surfaces, I should call them, uh, that uh, foliate space between A and B. Now, we can use this committer to do some analysis of, uh, of the re reaction coordinate. And this is an, uh, an old picture from uh, a, a review that we did already in 2002. So here is, uh, um, uh, again, a free energy landscape where we have an order parameter or collective variable Q. Uh, and here is a, uh, some other uh, collective, variab collective variables Q prime. And if the free energy landscape looks like this, hey, we have typically uh, uh, in state A and state B separated by this uh, transition state region, then you might imagine if you know about this Q uh, that this is the dividing surface, this dotted line. And indeed, if you now uh, restrict yourself to this line and you compute the committer on this line, you get always almost a half. Uh, you get roughly a half everywhere. And this particular uh, um, uh, behavior gives then rise to a uh, committer probability distribution, which looks like this. So this is the committer, dis uh, committer distribution uh, for this situation. And this is typically known as a good uh, CV or co uh, reaction coordinate uh, uh, because uh, all points on this surface actually belong to the uh, dividing surface. Now, the over here, you see something which is typically not good. Uh, so now here, this, uh, this is shifted or tilted with respect to the optimal dividing surface. And now you see that points over here uh, already commit to A, points over there commit to B. So this is typically not good. And so you can uh, uh, distinguish, distinguish very easily between those um, extremes. Now, you have also something in between. This is a typical situation where things are very diffusive. But this is what we call then a bad uh, RC. And by optimizing uh, the, uh, your... Uh, uh, collective variables or your description of the RC to come from here to there. Uh, that is what uh, reaction coordinate analysis is supposed to do. And um, um, to actually do that, you could, of course, compute the PB, the, the, the committer for all possible values of every Q that you can think of. But this is, of course, ridiculously expensive. Uh, so that's not being done. In uh, <coughs> uh, Therefore, uh, people have been using alternative approaches or more uh, effective approaches. And one of the first was actually the, uh, the neural network approach uh, by Ma and Dinner, uh, but uh, also uh, Best and Hummer actually introduced this Bayesian approach. Peterson Trout introduced the likelihood maximization. Uh, uh, together with uh, Utah and, uh, and others, uh, we looked at nonlinear string optimization. Uh, uh, more recently, um, a uh, Japanese group of Mori et al. actually introduced the cross-entropy minimization. And more lately, uh, uh, Hummer et al., uh, Jung and uh, co-workers, uh, introduced uh, the neural net approach with uh, symbolic regression as, the, uh, as, the, um, uh, as, as, a, as a new direction. Uh, I'm going to first introduce the likelihood maximization because that's kind of the basis of, uh, uh, of the... Uh, uh, well, not the basis, but it's a, it's a very uh, striking method that, you, that everyone can understand. So the reaction coordinate analysis from uh, um, uh, 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 using likelihood maximization starts with the realization that each path in a, uh, in a TPS uh, can be seen as a committer attempt. So here you have a, uh, a, an ensemble of paths uh, obtained from path sampling. And here, these red points, they denote these particular shooting points, as they are called, and uh, that uh, initiate uh, a new path from an old path. Now then, um, the idea is to use this information to optimize the model uh, reaction coordinates. Now the probability that a particular structure X uh, with uh, a, a certain value of this RC is also a transition path is simply the product of the forward and the backward committer. And if that's very easy to understand because if you are on a point, uh, the probability to go to B gives you the forward, uh, <coughs> the forward path, and the probability to go to A gives you the backward path, and together uh, they are the full path. 
And of course you can reverse and therefore you have this factor of two. Now, if you know this, uh, you, we can now uh, try to optimize uh, um, uh, this particular probability with likelihood maximization. And uh, we assume first a committer function. Uh, this is a model for the, uh, for the function. This is a typical sigmoid. So here you have uh, a, um, a, a reaction coordinate variable and the sigmoid function for the committer is uh, this blue line, yeah, the sigmoidal function. And by, uh, uh, just by definition, then the, uh, full, uh, co uh, the, the product of the two committers looks like this red line. And um, uh, we now parameterize this, uh, this reaction coordinate as a linear combination. It can also be done non-linearly, but for the moment only just linear. And then we can just say, uh, if uh, uh, we now try to optimize these coefficients by uh, maximizing this likelihood to say that if uh, the <coughs> Uh, the model can predict the outcome of the TPS as best as possible, then we have a good model. Now, this can be done, and uh, we applied it to uh, several, um, uh, 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 several uh, applications, but here is a, a, a very simple uh, uh, approach from uh, the Peters and Trout uh, paper. So here is a two-dimensional uh, uh, potential. We actually sample the shooting points. The green ones go to A and the red ones go to B. And then you can actually find out uh, the direction of the, uh, the best uh, um, collective variable. Now, this is all very fine. And this is actually the at the heart of uh, all these, uh, um, these methods that try to optimize the, um, uh, the reaction coordinate. Excuse me. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, a transition path is something that uh, goes from A to B. That's going to a, you could also have that it leaves A, goes to this X, and goes back to A. In fact, that's much more likely. So if you are somewhere, how do you say if you are on the transition path or not? If you're somewhere over here, you calculate these two values, and then uh, you ha know exactly what the probability is to be on a... It's actually this function here. Of course, the whole point is in finding out this R. Uh, so the R is undefined. So the R is the model that we're trying to, to get to reproduce this data. And this is precisely what this is doing here. Yeah, so we have here all these points. They go to B and these boards go to A. And now we fit it to the sigmoidal function such that this is actually optimized. So this is a, uh, okay, so it's just, in fact, it's just a regression method. It's just uh, fitting the data that we actually get from the shooting to the best model that we have. Uh, yeah, in fact, this is, um, we assume here diffusive dynamics. Uh, of course, you can also do it for non-diffusive dynamics, uh, but this is, of course, uh, uh, Markovianity uh, per definition. And it also has a reversible, but that's already a, a, a point that we do in the, uh, an assumption that we do in the TPS. Yeah, this is true. It's reversible. It's a Markov, uh, I should say, I should say uh, something. It's Markovian in the dynamics. But it's not uh, uh, Markovian in the reaction coordinate. It doesn't have to be, uh, if you do a projection, then you do get uh, memory often. This is, of course, a general problem. Um, I'd like to point out that um, the committer-based uh, RC methods, all this, the stuff that I actually introduced, actually usually perform two tasks. One task is to model the committer, as I, I said, uh, like a sigmoidal function. And uh, the likelihood maximization does that uh, uh, via uh, trial functions uh, of R as a function of the, uh, the linear expansion. But you can also take a neural net to actually do this. And you can also uh, uh, use uh, a, a different loss function like the cross entropy. And so uh, this is the model of the, of the committer. But at the same time, you also need to optimize the selection of the CVs and the dimensionality. So you need to, to select uh, um, uh, certain uh, CVs uh, to actually test for this particular model and, uh, and you actually have to change the number of uh, uh, dimensions. And this was al already uh, by the pioneering paper by Ma and Dinner, this was done by a genetic algorithm. 
Peters and Trout used the Bayesian information criterion, and Mori uh, uh, and co-workers used uh, an L2 uh, regularization. And uh, here we actually use an autoencoder, um, and we combine using this autoencoder both the uh, committer modeling, the feature selection, and the dimensional reduction in one approach. So how do we do that? Uh, we use an extended autoencoder for that. So the typical autoencoder uh, takes the feature input, uh, encodes it into a bottleneck, and then uh, actually decodes it again to the original uh, uh, input, uh, tries to optimize as, as uh, to reconstruct the input as good as, uh, as well as possible. And, um, uh, but we now also actually uh, use this bottleneck to predict the committer. And this is the committer uh, prediction part, and we also have the reconstruction part. Now, we use now all input uh, from the uh, path sampling as uh, all the shooting data, and we can even use the reweighted uh, path ensemble data. So this is uh, all data that is uh, available. We use the approximated uh, committer, which is just a, uh, a projection of the, uh, of the data on the uh, set of uh, input features. We use an in, uh, a nonlinear encoder, um, a nonlinear committer, and a nonlinear decoder, and then a binary lock uh, likelihood for the loss function. And then uh, we do optimization. And something that, uh, that comes out is as follows. So if we first test it on a simple double well, this is a 2D potential uh, 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 that is integrated. So this is just overdamped dynamics. Uh, it has 10 dimensions. So there's eight uh, dummy dimensions, which are harmonic potentials. And so particles can actually just run around in A and occasionally make this, uh, this, this switch between the two. Uh, here is the density uh, outside of the stable states, it's just for, uh, for your reference. And now we can actually also identify the, identify the committer. So this is the uh, ground truth, as you call it. We just calculate it uh, by brute force. And this is what the uh, autoencoder gives us. Um, so you can actually now also look how it reconstructs the, the space. And indeed, uh, uh, the reconstruction is such that uh, it, it just picks out x1 as the main variable, which, of course, you could have guessed in the, in the first place. And all the other are not, uh, not so important. So the latent space really looks like a straight line. And indeed, uh, that's what it does. So very good. That works. Then we do it for the uh, famous... Um, uh, nonlinear z potential, so this is like a, a more difficult 2D potential. Uh, it, it's not much more difficult, but this is of course a clearly a, no, a nonlinear reaction coordinate. So here is again two states, but now the system has to uh, uh, circumnavigate this this sort of uh, valley or whatever you want to call it, a barrier which has a, a very narrow um, uh, pathway here. Now you do uh, again the ground truth uh, uh, PB. And then when you do the prediction, uh, it really uh, picks out uh, the right uh, shape. So here is the, uh, uh, the P1 half surface, and this is actually roughly uh, very close to this P1 half surface. So it, f uh, it, it really finds uh, this, uh, uh, this Z uh, shape but, uh, uh, path. And indeed, when we do the reconstruction, uh, it, it's clear that X1 is an important uh, path. But now also X2 plays a role, and the rest is actually not so important. And when we actually look at the uh, s typical latent path, eh, it, it looks like this, and it really follows this Z uh, curve. So this, uh, this all uh, works uh, quite nice. And uh, so in the next um, application, or the next thing, is to actually uh, apply it to something uh, more complex. And that more complex, in my case, was the uh, gas hydrate nucleation. And for that, I actually uh, go quickly through some, um, uh, some background slides here. So we actually applied it to background, uh, to uh, gas nucleation, where we, sorry, hydrate nucleation, where we uh, wanted to un uh, go from liquid to uh, a crystal. And uh, I, th I think I'm uh, skipping some slides here. So we use, um, so you can see how one methane is being encapsulated by water molecules to stabilize a certain uh, a crystal structure. So here's the S1 crystal. And we, uh, we identify uh, two uh, families of order parameters, one that has a local uh, way of 
uh, estimating the size of the crystal and one that actually does uh, a, sh a local shape of the, uh, the cage around the, um, uh, the methanes. And uh, um, uh, I think I'm running a little bit out of time, but uh, for uh, do I have time? Yeah. All right. Um, so the uh, important for this, uh, for this uh, application to is to know that the cage ratio is, is 3 for a, 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 a pure crystal and is smaller than 1 for amorphous solids. So that means that as some uh, of these, uh, I mean if there's more big cages than small cages, then you have an S1 you, uh, uh, solid. And if there is uh, not, if there is more small than, than big, then you have an amorphous solid. And so this is a typical polymorph uh, transition, eh? and we have uh, uh, either uh, one or the other. And in fact, if you do brute force MD here at a very low temperature, so here you see an MD simulation, uh, you can form a solid, but clearly it's amorphous. And indeed, if we actually uh, look at the cage ratio of the two things, it is an amorphous solid. So that all uh, makes uh, sense. And indeed, if you actually uh, think of how uh, nucleation works, you have a free energy as a function of size. Uh, at very low temperature, eh, you also have a low barrier, and you actually go into the amorphous uh, uh, solid. And if you increase the temperature to something which is much more realistic, 280K, for example, and uh, you actually go to experimentally relevant uh, conditions, but this means that, uh, that you need something special because the uh, free energies become extremely high. And here we actually use uh, TPS uh, for doing that. So in, uh, when we actually, so the previous one was done over here in the previous slide, uh, but now I'm going to uh, 280, and you will see the difference. So here is a path sampling simulation of a um, of the uh, uh, of the Clairvay nu uh, <coughs> um, uh, nucleation, uh, and uh, this is showing a clear uh, S1 um, uh, pathway. So you see it, uh, it growing, and then suddenly it actually uh, flips into place. So that was the, uh, and then it overcomes the critical nucleation barrier and, uh, and, and solidifies into S1. Just to, uh, the induction time here is 30 kilo years. This is real time, whereas this is done in uh, uh, one mi microsecond right now. So the, uh, this is truly a very fast uh, transition compared to the, uh, uh, the resonance time. Just to show you that this actually changes at, uh, uh, at as a function of temperature. So here is the crystallinity, this case uh, ratio versus the uh, size. So now the size goes in the vertical direction. So all the pathways start over here in the liquid and move to the solid. At low temperatures you have amorphous, but um, if you move a little bit higher you can already see excursions to the crystalline phase and this is actually then uh, at uh, 285, it's completely crystalline. So uh, you really see this mechanism shifting uh, if, you, uh, if you increase the temperature. I interestingly enough, at 200K, uh, you have two channels and they actually are competing with each other. So here's the cage ratio again versus the size. And you see amorphous pathways competing with crystalline pathways and they really show different behavior. And in fact, they're completely determined by their initial, uh, initial nucleus. Uh, if uh, the crystalline has more of the big cages and the uh, amorphous have more of the other cages. So it is already determined in the beginning which path uh, uh, will take and that actually means it doesn't follow also a step rule. But that is uh, kind of an interesting uh, side conclusion. Um, I Now I really have to stop, not? Or, or do I have a, a little few more? Before? Five minutes, okay, right, okay. I think, I, uh, I think I'm fine with five minutes. Um, so we also can do kinetics. Actually, we use there for the uh, transition interface sampling method where we uh, introduce a number of milestones and these are given by these gray uh, um, uh, uh, surfaces. We call them interfaces. And then you can compute the probability for a path to reach uh, uh, the next interface provided that it crosses the first interface. And by uh, stratification, you can then co construct this uh, exact equation where we uh, 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 express the rate constant as a product of all these uh, um, uh, crossing probabilities. Just to uh, uh, quickly show it for the nucleation, so you see here the uh, 
uh, the crossing probability and indeed it actually goes down uh, nicely and it actually gives you precisely the uh, the rate it's actually uh, there's a whole story behind that I'm not I'm, I'm skipping that for the moment uh, it it looks like it's spot on with the experiments but this is fa uh, just coincidence because uh, in fact we have to correct for the finite size and then we get this green line so you see it's uh, already it's quite off the experiment but this is actually due to all kinds of other uh, uh, effects I'm happy to talk about this but uh, no, uh, I'm skipping it now so we can do now reaction coordinate analysis using the uh, likelihood maximization that gives us now a best model for two the collective variables so it turns out that at high on the cooling uh, uh, we can only get away with one uh, um, uh, collective variable which is the size uh, only size matters but at low on the cooling this is the higher temperatures we have to take the structure uh, so the important collective variables uh, are the nucleus size and in this case the big cage content now how does it so this was for the li likelihood maximization so how does the extended outer encoder work we now uh, use the full RPE so we actually take all pathways that we have we use a nonlinear encoder and we actually use this as a log likelihood uh, a loss function and uh, here we actually see of the most important uh, reaction coordinate of the most important collective variables we see all projections of the uh, of the uh, the committer and here is the predicted one and it actually uh, yeah it's uh, uh, we see that these uh, curves and uh, these uh, in these dividing surfaces are pretty good uh, uh, reproduced here's also uh, um, um, some reconstruction data so you see that most of the um, uh, that the M MCG not surprisingly reconstructs very well but also the big cages and the small cages as well as the number of waters actually reconstruct very nicely uh, and we can also then find out what the most important uh, uh, ingredient is and these are these uh, these three here these are the three peaks and then you can also uh, see how it uh, how how much more information you have if you use the full RPE so this is the full uh, reweighted path ensemble and you get uh, a much better dividing surface here than from the shooting data alone all right in, in the last uh, uh, minute I want to uh, summarize also what we uh, did together with uh, the group of Gerhard Hummer who actually um, uh, uh, developed a new method to sample transition pathways using deep uh, reinforcement learning um, while at the same time learn the committer uh, so this is the committer prediction part of our uh, autoencoder but instead of doing the reconstruction uh, their group actually used symbolic regression to make it interpretable now my student Arjun also did that and uh, uh, he, he also find out that the input importance of the uh, the big cages uh, the waters and the uh, the temperatures was important and this was actually all constructed into a, a one big simplified model and I enlarge it here so this is the, uh, the the sigmoidal function of the committer and this is the uh, reaction coordinate and it has all these ingredients here and just to uh, show you how uh, uh, yeah how, s how, how that then works as a function of temperature uh, uh, system size of um, uh, waters and uh, uh, size uh, sorry the the big cages you can see that there is a shift of the of the mechanism from a low temperature uh, to a high temperature so that works uh, uh, that, that, that condenses uh, 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 all of this information um, this is the p1 half surface and here are some uh, low committer and high committer surface so this actually shows you how you can actually find out uh, um, expressions for for these reaction coordinates uh, based on the machine learning uh, approach okay so uh, I'm summarizing now so the TPS of the hydrates actually uh, give um, uh, formation gives us uh, paths uh, that actually show a, a broad distribution of uh, transitions uh, forms amorphous and uh, uh, SI states uh, this uh, the crystals uh, you can actually have coexistence between those and we can actually have a, a nucleation rate that is uh, is relatively close to uh, the experimental uh, uh, data but it's very influenced by a gas reservoir that's a technical detail here's the uh, reaction coordinate analysis um, uh, conclusions 
uh, that the size of the nucleus is important, the uh, size of the structure um, uh, and uh, size and the structure is important, they're low on the cooling, and that we can use this new extended autoencoder to predict this. Um, I'm skipping the, the, the other two, uh, two things because I'm running out of time. I just want to end with two general uh, conclusions, is that we can now uh, use this extended AI effectively to do these two tasks at the same time, and we can actually uh, uh, show that it's, it works on the simple models and the more complicated uh, crystal nucleation models. Uh, an important point is that you can also apply it to straightforward uh, MD trajectory uh, and that we actually can uh, use this symbolic regression to, uh, to find uh, important uh, uh, functions. Um, okay, so I leave this for, for now. I just wanted to say that we can now uh, combine machine learning and trajectory sampling to, uh, to find out reaction coordinates in more uh, detail and I leave it with that. Thanks. Do we have questions for Peter? Um, if you, in, in your autoencoder, right, you can also use the, a time lag autoencoder, right? Yeah. Um, do you think that would make, would it make a huge difference? Because, I mean, if you, if you think about predicting the committer together with the structure, you already have a sort of like an information about the the future of your trajectory in the committer prediction, right? Um, yeah. So I'm wondering if, if that would make, I don't know, if it would make it better or worse or if it really doesn't matter in this case. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I haven't thought about it this, uh, this much. In some sense, the committer already has the time information in it. Yeah? So you, you know what the future of the, the path is. Yeah. So I wonder if you, yeah, so then the question is, what do you really, on top of that, put into this autoencoder? Then that this is not, uh, so you could use a vamp net or something like that, but the question is what you put in. So I don't know, yeah, maybe it works. You, but you have the data anyway, so I was just wondering if you... If you I haven't considered that, but it's a nice uh, idea yeah. to try this, uh, this week. It was more of a technical question. On some of your slides, you had uh, downright an importance measure uh, histogram. Yeah. And uh, no, I was just, uh, I didn't get uh, exactly what it was and how that had to be interpreted. Well, uh, it's a simple measure. Oh, so this, uh, it's a simple measure that uh, um, shows you what the contribution uh, of each of these CVs is to the, um, uh, neural net predictor, so the encoder. So we have an encoder, and uh, what what the contribution is of one feature towards the uh, to the bottleneck to the outcome is is encoded in that input measure. So how does it it's like a well there's a final value, and so it's like if you're taking that feature out. Uh, how much uh, distribution is changed? Or yeah, that's another option. We we did not do that. Uh, this is this is much simpler than that. It just shows you, uh, yeah, how m how important it is uh, in the um, or how important it is, but the co what the coefficient is in the uh, uh, final. Uh, it's a linear combination, a linear and combination. Uh, and so you're looking right. at the coefficient. Yeah. Okay. yeah, this is the, this analysis is only for the non -linear, for the linear part. Okay, no, so then so I the yeah. non-linear part we could also do it, but it's uh, that was not uh, in the paper. It's more convoluted than in the... Sorry? No, yeah, in the non-linear part, it's more convoluted it's more to get an importance. Right. And so also, just a technical quick question, well, if I, if I may. Um, did you do some kind of L1 uh, you know, regularization in order to cut out uh, a few features, like lasso, you know, instead of this L2 weight decay, uh, just to make it, to highlight more which country, which... Uh, yeah, so feature. this is, okay, so... Um, the answer is, is no. Uh, so the pre there was, of course, a, not of course, there was a pre-selection. So in the, in, the, in the model systems, in the 2D model systems, we used just all uh, features or all uh, dimensions. So that was, of course, very low dimensional. But for the uh, clever nucleation, you have in principle, of course, uh, 30,000 uh, 
dimensions, which is of course much too, 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 too many. So we already did a, a pre-selection of uh, 22, um, uh, well, what we thought interesting um, features. And this is of course maybe not enough, but yeah, this is what we could do at the moment. Maybe, maybe you need something uh, more like uh, soap kernels and all, uh, all kinds of correlation functions, bond order parameters, but we didn't uh, do that. So it was a pre-selection, and then we based on this pre-selection, we did the optimization. Yeah, I mean, we I know we haven't always also been doing everything we should have uh, in, a, you know, we could have, uh, exactly. so it's yeah. more like it's a, it's a, it's a, next a forum for discussion here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, but it's true. I mean, this is not, uh, so this is certainly not the final, uh, end, uh, the final word on this, uh, this type of approaches. But this is how, uh, okay, so in that sense, it's not so different from what uh, Ma and Dinner already did in 2005, uh, where they also did a pre-selection of features, feed it into a neural net, sorry, feed it into a genetic algorithm and then try to get the best uh, combinations of all these uh, features uh, to predict the committer. And here, of course, with the outer encoder, we do that. Uh, in fact, we do also do that. We put in all the, f the features and then outcome the, the ones that are important. Uh, so this, this selection is done uh, automatically. Uh, yeah, and yeah so, we don't, uh, so we don't have to use a regularization for that step. But maybe uh, this is to be discussed. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we didn't. Uh, this is an important point. Uh, uh, it's another thing to optimize. The bottleneck is uh, uh, either one or two uh, nodes. Uh, but we found that for uh, if, if as a function of the number of nodes, actually we hardly uh, saw anything improving in the loss. So uh, we only stuck to the low dimensional um, uh, bottleneck. Um. Yeah, so, so I mean to, uh, I don't want to take too much and time here. And of course, it also uh, needs to be optimized. Yeah, this is another thing. Yeah, yeah, but somehow the training error is not always the best uh, measure because somehow as you increase the dimension, the training error only decreases yeah. uh, slightly, but uh, you know, then we have to look at something a bit more refined information yeah. than no, I, I guess this is just, I, I agree. I think this can be a, a lot more refined. This is just the first, uh, our first attempt at this. Uh. But it's not that I um, have a better option here either. Well, it's more <laughs> yeah, th I mean, that's yeah, uh, precisely, we're we just listing things to be discussed. Uh, colors, uh, stochastic, uh, I mean, this is all deterministic, of course. So if you use some stochasticity, it might actually work much better. I think there was another question. Yeah. Or or is is there another time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's already answered. Oh, wow. Any other questions? I would have one, but I will, I will wait. You will oh be around. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, already, uh, so, yes, thanks, Peter, again. And our next speaker is Gabriel Stoltz. Who's getting what revenge? Is that going to be revenge? What? But it's just that we did. Uh, I, I thought about uh, quite a few things this summer, and. Uh,
Okay, so for our last talk of the day, uh, we welcome Gabriel Stoltz, who will tell us about reducing the mini batching error in Bayesian inference with adaptive Langevin dynamics. So thank you for the invitation here. It's a pleasure to be in Paris. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I really recommend this as a city to live in. Uh, I'll try to make a transition between the MD day and the Bayesian inference day, which is more or less tomorrow. So uh, I think it was, of course, on purpose that you put me at the end of the day. And so that's why I took it, you know, I took it really at heart to, to do that transition. <laughs> uh, I hope what I'll be saying will still be of use to people I in MD and in particular because I I'll be focusing on this uh, mini batching uh, thing uh, in uh, Bayesian inference when you have uh, lots of data points and you don't want to compute exactly the, the gradient force that you see in your, uh, mo in your molecular dynamics. So for people from MD, you could think of it as uh, what happens if I'm not evaluating exactly the gradient of my potential energy to compute the forces, but if I only have some kind of a stochastic estimator of that. And this would happen, for instance, if you discard uh, randomly some interactions, or if you say you have uh, quantum computations to compute the forces, but you're not exactly converging your quantum computations. Anyway, so I'll, uh, I'll first uh, motivate uh, why mini batching can be a good idea to reduce the cost and what uh, extra error it incurs. And then we'll see a way to reduce those errors and possibly, you know, uh, remove them. But that's a bit of a science fiction at the moment. Uh, I'll try to be uh, not too long because I'm the last person between you and your evening. And so if you want to read more about that, I mean, everything would be in that second paper uh, uh, quoted here. And the slides are already on my web page if, uh, you know, if you fall asleep at some point and you, you want to follow up. So let's, uh, let's look at what this mini-batching problem is. So I'm really thinking at some Bayesian inference problem over here. So I've got some parameters, some data points xi, which are given to me. And I want to exclaim them with a statistical model, which is parameterized by some theta parameter uh, to, to be inferred. And so the, the, Bayesian, uh, the Bayesian perspective on that is to have a distribution of parameters that could explain uh, uh, my data points and have some prior distribution in it. And this is the high dimensional probability measure I want to sample. Uh, one typical example, uh, which I'll be illustrating uh, my, uh, uh, my talk with, will, would be this uh, kind of Gaussian mixture model. We have data points from, uh, from two Gaussians, uh, which are, uh, well, a mixture of two Gaussians, as the name indicates, uh, uh, with weights uh, W and the two centers. And so if you have data points from that, typically the a posteriori distribution on theta would be bimodal, essentially centered around mu1 and mu2. So you have uh, here a multimodal distribution to sample, not so high dimensional because it's only a 2D uh, distribution, but still there is multimodality, so that's something that's uh, that uh, people with MD are familiar with, I would say. So that's, uh, so what I could be doing is I could be just running usual Monte Carlo or usual Langevin, overdump Langevin dynamics. But if I do that, uh, I'll need to evaluate uh, a force uh, which will require me to sample over the end data points. Uh, and so this is uh, the cost of that uh, scales linearly with the number of data points. And if, you know, in this big data area, uh, this, uh, this may be a very large number. So maybe I'd prefer to uh, have a random, an unbiased random evaluation of this uh, very large sum. And this is what I'm doing here with this uh, uh, stochastic uh, estimator of the gradient, uh, where I'm just picking a certain number of points at random with or without resampling. That's, uh, I mean, that's, I was going to say, that's your business, that's your choice uh, as a user. And then you just uh, renormalize. So if you take a little endpoints out of your uh, large uh, end data number of points, uh, you just remultiply uh, your average by end data in order to have some consistent estimator. So that's nice in principle, except that uh, this means that uh, your force, your actual stochastic force, is the, the one you really want, uh, plus some extra error term which involves a factor epsilon n, which is typically of the order of uh, the number of data points squared divided by little n. So divided by little n, that's OK, but ouch about the n data or square term over here, because it means that your um, stochastic error may be extremely large when you have lots of data points. And if you're a bit too greedy on choosing the number of uh, uh, points at which you evaluate uh, the gradient uh, of the elementary likelihood. 
Um, so that's one point. So there is this pre-factor which is important and which somehow uh, hadn't been seen so uh, clearly quantified in the literature in terms of impact on the bias on the distribution you're actually sampling. The other quantity which is important is this covariance matrix. So of course it's a very large matrix. Uh, it's a D by D matrix. For, okay, so for my 2D mixture problem, it's a two by two matrix, so we could compute it. But in principle, it, uh, it's a matrix which has uh, the square dimension of the parameters you're estimating. So this may be a really a huge number. So it's, uh, I mean, I'm writing it here, but it's mostly, I mean, as a conceptual to as a conceptual object you you want to consider in practice, you're not going to evaluate this matrix. So the whole game will be to uh, reduce the errors without knowing that matrix. That's the that's the rule. Uh, and this Z uh, random variable there, it's just uh, you know centered and with uh, identity covariance, it just uh, everything's been rescaled so that it's uh, like that. So that's uh, that's my uh, stochastic estimator of the force. And then I can, uh, well, first there is a plot to show you that it's indeed something which is non-trivial. So for my 2D, uh, for, for my 2D uh, Gaussian mixture model, I can look in a space, uh, a theta 1, theta 2, what this uh, covariance matrix looks like. So again, this is not something you're going to do uh, in real life, but here it's like 2D simulation, so one can have the patience to compute uh, those curves. And I've, we've, I've identified with those red things the two uh, important modes, so a mode around the theta, theta 1 equal 1 and the other around 0.5, and then the, the two... Uh, the two uh, uh, the two variables exchanged. So those are the two important modes. And what you see is that in those modes, uh, the entries of the covariance matrix are really uh, changing. I mean, it's not constant. That's, uh, that's an important remark because uh, many, uh, well, some methods in the literature uh, work best under the assumption that this covariance matrix is constant, which is not really the case here. So uh, and the other thing is that uh, this, uh, this random, uh, when, uh, when I'm looking at this uh, decomposition between the, uh, uh, the expectation and the stochastic error, the second thing is that the noise that appears in the stochastic estimator is only Gaussian if uh, you, know you have a certain number of uh, mini-batching points. So I have a colleague uh, in my lab that says that the central limit theorem holds true uh, for n equals 30, and here, you know, that's an empirical uh, demonstration that indeed uh, for n equals 30, you're more or less Gaussian in the noise. But of course, for n equals 1, you've got something which is terribly non-Gaussian. I'd say as non-Gaussian as possible. Um, but in fact, uh, it's not so important uh, for the mathematical analysis I'll be doing at its Gaussian. And this plot was just to highlight that issue, that I'm not doing some Gaussian assumption here. Okay, so now uh, we have... Uh, this measure to sample. We have a stochastic estimator of the force. So one natural dynamics uh, is to use this uh, stochastic uh, gradient Langevin dynamics where it's the usual overdone Langevin dynamics discretized using euler maruyama scheme and replacing the estimator of the gradient of the potential or the gradient of the log likelihood by the stochastic estimator of the force. And if you believe in the formula I put down here, uh, with this uh, uh, noise factor and then this random variable, uh, one can show that uh, in some uh, in some sense uh, this numerical scheme is is uh, can be seen as realization at dominant order in delta t of this effective Langevin dynamics, which corresponds to the Langevin dynamics you're used to, except that uh, here there is a modification of order delta t. Of the, uh, of the noise in front of the Brownian motion. So that's the effect of this extra noise that I'm adding here in this variable ft hat. Uh, it's, is I'm, so I'm, I'm adding some extra noise which comes with a prefactor delta t. And so in, in the end, it amounts to modifying the, here the, the, the diffusion coefficient by a factor uh, delta t as well. So this formula somehow shows you that because this covariance matrix sigma x is positive, it's as if you're uh, doing uh, overdamp Langevin dynamics at a slightly higher temperature, a temperature that is delta t higher. So people in MD know that then you tend to uh, broaden the distribution of parameter. Uh, so you can show that um, when you're doing this uh, mini batching dynamics, you have uh, an error on the invariant measure, which is of order epsilon n times delta t. 
And I recall that epsilon n is something which is really large because it scales as the number of data points squared divided by little n. So this is really an error which is much larger than the usual uh, time discretization error uh, you're doing. Yep. Just to test it valid, even if the, if the noise is non, even if you're in the non Gaussian assumption? Yes, uh, because I mean it's a weak error type estimate. So I mean the, the mathematical formu formalization of what I was, you know, hand waving about uh, dynamics being closed means that uh, the weak error uh, of the numerical scheme can is at uh, order delta t to the three over one time step the weak error of that dynamics. So because I'm only talking about weak error, I'm only seeing moments of my uh, noise and not really uh, the fact that it's Gaussian or not. So that's, I would say, that's um, the standard uh, analysis uh, for uh, stochastic gradient Langevin dynamics. But so people in MD know that, uh, you know, overdump, it's fun for doing math because it's a non-degenerate uh, dynamics. Uh, but in practice, Langevin works better. So let's try and see what uh, mini batching gives on Langevin. Um, I think, Jonathan, you worked on that with Charles, huh? Yeah. And I think I forgot to, no, to, to quote your name on the slide. So I'm, I'm just realizing it now, so I'm sorry for that. Uh, we do quote you in your paper. <laughs> so I mean, you can do it on, on Langevin, and so you would do your usual uh, kind of uh, splitting schemes, the same as you see in MD with uh, fluctuation dissipation, update of the positions, and then update of the uh, momenta based on estimating the force. So if you do that, of, um, and, I'm, and I'm insisting on doing the splitting that way so that I'm only evaluating the force uh, once a time step uh, with this mini batching procedure in the middle. <coughs> so when you do that, you do the same algebra of those effective dynamics and you can show that uh, everything in the end boils down to uh, changing the fluctuation dissipation from the one you had uh, for the continuous dynamics to one that's perturbed again by a factor delta t. And you also had that uh, in, your, in your work. So here, no surprise somehow, even though your splitting scheme would be second order if, every si if the noise was perfectly uh, evaluated, here you fall back to some uh, much larger first order error because you're doing mini batching. So you're really not doing well and numerics confirms that uh, you know, uh, errors are pretty large. So here it's a L1 error. So the it's a L1 error in the marginal distribution of uh, one of the two uh, components of my uh, one of the two centers of my uh, Gaussian distribution. So L1 error means it's a difference of two, uh, the, integral between it the integral between the two probability densities. So it's at most two. So typically, uh, L1 this L1 error should be of order 0 0.1 or less, otherwise you're really making large errors. And here you see that uh, unless you take absurdly small uh, time steps like five, uh, times 10 to the minus 5 in reduced units, you get errors which are really uh, pretty soon uh, very large and which increase a lot as you, uh, as you increase the number of uh, mini batching points. Uh, voilà. Because here, I mean, this limit, it's uh, no mini batching. And I think that here, it's uh, the limit of uh, only one point for mini batching. So some curves, you know, we, we don't even continue them over there because it's just, uh, it's just absurdly large then. Okay, so that's uh, that the message here was that there are large uh, errors when you do mini-batching if, uh, if you are a bit greedy on the mini-batching. And you should be greedy because uh, it's about uh, making the dynamics more cost-effective. So, uh, you know, you wouldn't want to take too many <coughs> mini-batching points. So some um, years ago, um, some people came up with this idea of using nose over like uh, dynamics uh, to, uh, to reduce this mini-batching error. So it was initially suggested by Jones and Lime Kuller more in a MD context and then taking over in a, I would say, Bayesian inference context by uh, Bob Skill and some of his uh, co-workers at the time. And then it was revisited a bit later on by Ben uh, with uh, Shasheng Shang. So the idea is that uh, everything works under the assumption that the covariance matrix is constant, which you know is not true now, but still, I mean, let's... Uh, Let's do it that way. Let's assume that we have uh, this uh, unknown uh, covariance matrix. Uh, and let's try to, uh, to get rid of the extra uh, bias that's, uh, that's coming from there. And so the idea of uh, adaptive Langevin is that this unknown matrix, which should be essentially, maybe I'm writing it here. Uh, this, uh, this matrix should be essentially what you have initially as noise plus epsilon n delta t 
and then your, co your uh, covariance matrix. So you don't know the covariance matrix, and so overall you don't know this, uh, this noise matrix. You'd still want to uh, sample the correct measure. And so the idea of adaptive Langevin dynamics is to put some kind of a feedback mechanism, uh, which, is going which is the following. If the temperature is too high, so if the fluctuation term is too high, you'll have a momenta which will be too large, so too much kinetic energy in the system. So then you have this term is large, and then you're going to increase uh, this uh, psi t variable, which is the friction. So it's really if, uh, too much uh, kinetic energy, so increase the friction, so then you decrease more the, the momenta. And if the momenta are too s then become too small, somehow this term will become negative, and you'll, re you'll decrease the friction, and then uh, you'll allow momenta to grow back again. So there is a kind of feedback mechanism, which is there really to, uh, to target an identity of a, uh, a constant uh, yeah. uh, distribution in the momenta which has a identity covariance and which is just the target measure in pi. And then so when you, when you work out the math for this uh, dynamics, you can show that it admits, admits an invariant measure, which is this one. So you have that those psi variables cent nicely center <coughs> around uh, the component psi ij of uh, of this friction, they, they really center around the components A, I, J of this unknown uh, friction uh, matrix. And the nice thing is that this is true whatever the choice of uh, eta and whatever the value of A was in the, in the first place. So that's a it's, re it's a very nice uh, feedback mechanism, but which really relies on the fact that here sigma, uh, this, con this uh, covariance matrix is constant. So for... Um, the motivation also for uh, this um, adaptive Langevin dynamics is that uh, it should be seen, in fact, as some form of effective dynamics for, uh, for this kind of uh, strength splitting. So if you, if you look at these dynamics, uh, I've said that, you know, I don't know A, so you would wonder why I'm putting here A because I don't know A. So I'm, there is no way I'm going to simulate that dynamics. And the point is that this is not the dynamics I'll be simulating. What I'll be simulating is this splitting scheme, which is essentially the one I showed for Langevin, except that I'm replacing uh, the constant friction by a friction which is a dynamical variable and which I'm uh, updating according to this rule. So when I'm doing this splitting, so uh, fluctuation dissipation with, this, with the current value of Xi, update of Xi, and then update of the position, update of the momenta, and so on and so forth. I can show that the effective dynamics associated with this splitting is exactly this adaptive Langevin dynamics. So I know that at a uh, second order in the time step, uh, this uh, splitting scheme has this measure as an invariant probability measure. So somehow I've removed at dominant order the, uh, the mini batching error uh, that way. Uh, so that's really the statement here. When sigma is x is constant, then you have this, uh, the bias on the invariant measure if it's o is of order delta t squared. Well, up to a pre-factor, which is still a bit large. The important uh, point is that uh, sigma of x usually is not constant. So uh, then, in fact, the actual error you're making is, a more is still proportional to epsilon n delta t, but then to some uh, projection of your covariance matrix. I mean, you saw your take you just retain for the covariance matrix the, uh, I would say, the subdominant part. So you're, uh, you're taking out the average of your, your sigma x matrix. So when sigma x uh, is constant, this term indeed disappears. And otherwise, it's something that is uh, much smaller than what you would have wi with Langevin, because in Langevin, essentially, you would not be subtracting this, uh, this average. So that was... Uh, uh, that was our analysis of adaptive Langevin in the case when sigma x uh, was not constant. And if you do uh, then the, the numerics, you can really show that there is a lot of improvement. If you look at the scale here of, my, uh, of the slides, we've, we, we've really reduced the vertical axis. Uh, and here we're using much larger time steps. I mean, I think that before the, the large, the smallest uh, time step was the green one, and here it's the, uh, sorry, before the largest time step was the green one, and now it's the smallest one. So it's this dynamics is really much more effective in reducing the error. And uh, yeah, everything is much, uh, much smaller. 
Well, errors are much smaller. One thing is that you can also play on the shape of uh, your approximation of this uh, covariance matrix. So you can try to uh, estimate uh, sigma x as really a full-blown uh, d by d matrix. That's you know, quite expensive if you have lots of degrees of freedom to, to sample. Uh, because then it's a huge matrix to, to put in. Or you can make other approximation to this covariance matrix. You can, for instance, uh, be looking just for the scalar number and so try to approximate your full covariance matrix by its best scalar approximation somehow. And in all, those in all cases, you have an error which is epsilon n delta t and then this projection error onto the space of uh, matrices you're considering. So either constant matrices or scalar uh, multiplied by the identity, uh, whatever you prefer. In this example, I mean, it, uh, you can see that uh, whether you, when you take a scalar matrix instead of a two by two matrix, you're not really uh, increasing a lot the error. So scalar is already uh, more or less okay, I would say. Alors, there, there were slides uh, which I'm going to skip about the convergence of adaptive Langevin dynamics. It's for the few uh, aficionados of uh, hypocoercivity in the room. There is at least one, uh, I know. Uh, and so it's about uh, converge mathematical convergence of these dynamics. It's not so easy because you have a dynamics which is uh, really uh, degenerate. So you have noise only in that variable and you would like to transfer the noise both in the theta variable, it's like uh, transferring noise from velocities to position, but also you'd like to transfer the noise to this uh, friction variable. And so it's unclear whether this dynamics converges and whether you can have a sharp rates of decay. And here it's more like an advertisement slide for saying that uh, you can use techniques of uh, hypocoercivity, uh, which are uh, you know, functional analytical estimates uh, uh, dating back to the years 2000 to prove that uh, indeed you have convergence here and that it happens at the rate uh, you imagine. Well, maybe you don't imagine a rate at this stage, but uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's something we can, we can be discussing and there is a <coughs> clear rationale for uh, uh, making sure that the rates you get at the end are uh, the ones you expect. Uh, okay, and so this was this uh, statement which I'm going to skip to, to keep a few minutes for just presenting one possible extension, uh, which was to say that now that we lucidly realize that our covariance matrix depends uh, on the theta variable, we, well, maybe there is something we can do about it to, to still reduce the mini batching error. And the idea would be uh, to say that uh, what happens if we in, this, in a fortunate situation where we can expand our uh, covariance matrix onto uh, a certain basis of functions. So of course, uh, the question I get every time, and it's a legitimate question, is what's the basis of function to choose here on the dimensionality and so on. So we are going to get to that point, maybe, or otherwise, you know, you can ask the question later. But for the moment, let's just take it for granted that uh, I can expand my covariance matrix onto that basis of function fk with some unknown uh, matrix parameters sk uh, to be uh, determined somehow. And the key thing is that, uh, well, if you are in this fortunate setting, then maybe you can also expand your friction variable onto the same basis and consider this extended adaptive Langevin dynamics where you have a, a certain nose hoover like dynamics for each of those matrix coefficient. So it's really the, the usual adaptive Langevin dynamics, except that here you're multiplying by this function fk, and here you're summing uh, the various uh, coefficients uh, sigma k multiplied by uh, the fk functions. And so if you, uh, uh, if you have followed a bit uh, what I've said before, or if you believe in me, or if you're fed up uh, with the math and you don't want to fight. Uh, I mean, here is the estimates that you get in the end is that you have some kind of projection error of this uh, unknown uh, covariance matrix onto the, the space uh, spanned by those, uh, uh, by those uh, basis functions fk. So the promise, the promise of, uh, noise of, uh, of uh, s reduction of the systematic bias is here is that as you increase the basis size, uh, you're going to reduce that projection error and ultimately maybe you can bring it down to zero. This will of course cost you uh, quite a bit in terms of unknowns because here 
if you do things, I would say, naively, each of these matrix would be a D by D matrix. And so if you are really uh, sampling high dimensional uh, parameters, uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, unknowns involved here. Uh, S, uh, you said? Yeah. Uh, F, I mean, yeah, that's precisely, that's you to decide. Of our media, that's the user to decide. So let's consider an example, excellent transition for the next example, which is let's go back to this uh, 2D um, simple uh, mixture of two Gaussians. And so we have this theta 1, theta 2 variable. So in this case, I know that I have some kind of uh, position dependence for the entries of my covariance matrix. One natural idea is to say, okay, let's chop up my domain into four uh, subdomains. And that's, you know, that's, the, that's the blue cross in the middle. And then I can consider, for instance, an approximation using indicator functions of the domains. So the first, uh, if I take uh, here uh, capital K equal one unknown, uh, it means that I'm trying to approximate everything uh, by uh, just a constant over the full domain. So I'm trying, I'm, I'm going for a two by two matrix uh, with constant entries everywhere. If I'm going to k equal four, I'm going to divide my domain into four subdomains and then consider a constant value which may be different from one domain to the other. So that's already going into the direction of being a bit more uh, uh, position dependent. And then what I can do, I can try to, uh, the next step would be then to go to uh, these uh, 15 of a uh, 16 number of degrees of freedom where I would uh, have some kind of uh, affine polynomial on each of the domains. And when you do that, uh, well, it's more or less clear from the picture that uh, the functions you're trying to approximate are more or less affine around those uh, red uh, circles. And so when you do that, you, you have a, a projection error, which is more or less zero. So that's, uh, yeah. That would be one choice of a, a function that work uh, for a in a low dimensional scenario uh, where, we, where, where it's based on some kind of uh, uh, spatial decomposition. This is mostly to illustrate that the, errors esti the error estimates we have are uh, correct because somehow we are putting in line uh, uh, the projection error, which is decreasing, and here it's going down to zero. And here we, are, we have the L1 error, and when the projection error is uh, close to zero, the L1 error is also very small, and you only have the time step uh, bias here that's left. In practice, and that's the transition towards the perspective slide, in practice, of course, you wouldn't be, if you have like uh, parameters to estimate in a truly high dimensional space, you wouldn't be uh, thinking of, uh, you know, spatial decompositions and so on. And I mean, to me, the, the output of that study is, uh, is there to tell you that one key thing is this, the structure of this covariance matrix. And as far as I know, it's not really well understood currently uh, what the structure of this uh, uh, covariance matrix is. And the, what, we s what we've seen on, uh, in our numerical experiments, in particular on Bayesian neural networks, uh, is that this uh, covariance matrix is uh, extremely, uh, of, uh, if of extremely uh, low rank. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe just one or two percent of the eigenvalues uh, contribute to the spectrum of this uh, matrix. So typically, if you, if you knew it was rank one with a fixed direction, it would be very easy to uh, cope, uh, for, uh, to, to remove the mini-batching error. At the moment, I'm not sure what's the uh, this actual structure of this covariance matrix, whether you know, it's, well, it's almost, uh, it's, it's low rank, but the directions may be changing. I don't really have a good handle on what's the structure of the covariance matrix. So in order to make that really effective uh, for uh, more complicated and truly high dimensional models, I think that's the first step to understand the structure of this covariance matrix, and that's something th of interest also for other people, like for people doing SGD and trying to understand why SGD works. I mean, the structure of the covariance matrix is really important because it not it's not just any matrix. And well, yeah, otherwise, uh, if I've lost you there, I mean, the summary of the talk would be, I mean, those uh, estimates that appear on the at the beginning of the slide, and uh, well, I think I'll close here and uh, ask, uh, answer any question, hopefully, if you, if you had. Thank you for your attention. Any questions for Gabriel?
So here, uh, along your uh, your algorithm, you are learning something about the either the f the matrix uh, xi, uh, sigma of x or uh, some projection, and so uh, uh, an information you get is uh, how large is the, this uh, covariance matrix, and so naturally you could say, okay, I'm going to adapt the small n of x by uh, paying more budget uh, in places where the variance is higher uh, than uh, the places uh, where it uh, wouldn't. So first, so, so do does your uh, and I, because at the end you have uh, an error which is with, with this L2 norm. So it's not local; it's something global. But would you get exactly the same thing, but just multiplied by your weight? Ep ex ex instead of the epsilon of n, uh, you would have something uh, in the L2 norm, which is uh, epsilon of f n of x, uh, something like that? I think I would, yeah. Um, my reservation with that, I mean, in the current example I have in mind, uh, it turns out that this average here is, enfin, sigma is really has really non-trivial values, but the average is close to zero. And it seems that wa that's one of the situations we are encountering. I mean, the troublesome situation with uh, the usual adaptive Langevin is when uh, adaptive Langevin removes the average of uh, sigma x. And for Bayesian neural networks, uh, at least, we see that this average is anyway close to zero, but still you have a very l strong variation. So that's uh, but so what you suggest I is a. Uh, uh can be done indeed, and I think it would indeed uh, be putting the epsilon n inside if you had, uh, uh, but that's if you really have some kind of, uh, in average, uh, some uh, non-zero signal for a sigma x. Otherwise, it's a bit more, uh, it's a bit more complicated than that, and you need to find something uh, that when you multiply sigma x, when you multiply sigma x by this function, that it gives you a non-zero average with respect to the invariant measure. And that's what we are struggling with. Uh. Thank you. Um, I think it's the related question, but like, can you also try, because you're seeing more and more data, can you try to learn the basis of function as you, like uh, in an online, uh, in an online way, like trying to adapt the basis as, as you see more and more data? Uh, so for the moment, we haven't really, I mean, this extended adaptive uh, with the basis function, I have to say that uh, it's not really been uh, done in production mode currently. Uh, it we've more been using the framework at the moment wh when you really have a truly high dimensional parameters to infer like in BNNs. Uh, uh, it's just a nightmare already to construct one constant matrix uh, sigma x, so you know, like the k equals zero term here, constant function here, I have just one matrix, uh, that's already too large. Because in your neural net, you may have you know, thousands of parameters, so it me would mean a matrix thousand by thousand, something like that. Um, so I'd say that uh, currently your question is a bit of a science fiction to us, because it's, uh, it's already about, uh, instead of having this full matrix, uh, what are we retaining? And so the the current thing with those BNNs would be to have layer-wise uh, structures and maybe have, a, you know, there would be a weight one, a bias, and then a second weight if we have a two-layer thing. And then to have uh, like a constant or maybe diagonal matrices for each of those uh, subparts and try to combine that. Uh, but then the question, the legitimate question is, you know, what would be your approximation for each of those layers? Should it be a full matrix, diagonal, and so on? And yeah, that's a... Uh, I don't yet have a good answer to that, I uh, have to admit. Uh, we're still trying to uh, yeah, see on representative example what happens. Other questions? <coughs> yeah, this is uh, just a naive question for me to understand uh, how you apply this. So what would be now the ultimate uh, application of this type of uh, this extended uh, adaptive launch and dynamics. So, so why would you would like to? So one, one current application we're considering is this uh, Bayesian neural network. So I don't know whether you're familiar with that, but it, it, it's like you would have uh, data points. Uh, so it's a classification problem. Typically, you would have uh, points in a with label A and others with label B, and you'd like to learn some kind of uh, function that separates them. 
So when you're close to the data point here, you would say you would have uh, the value zero and here the value one. But when you're far away from the, from the two data sets, you'd want to avoid to have either zero and or one, you, you but more something which has some form of uh, distribution of values, like you know, something which would be more or less, uh, ideally, when you're far away, you would have uh, like a flat distribution of uh, probabilities between zero and one, because then you would know that you don't know. So that's the, <laughs> that's the thing. And so that's uh, Bayesian neural networks are done for that. So it's a neural net that predicts a probability between zero and one. And typically, you'd like to uh, here to sample outputs of uh, the, the neural network uh, would give you outputs and theta of x. And you would like to sample the parameters of the neural networks that would uh, explain things. And so then you would have some uh, uncertainty quantification of uh, uh, because you'd know that the you know that you have lots of models that explain the data, but far away they, they disagree a lot. So you'd have this distribution of probability values uh, depending on the parameters of the neural net. All right, and, and you actually use the uh, ADL to actually get yeah, to this. And so uh, Inas, the PhD student uh, who's been uh, really active on that. Uh, she has been uh, sampling parameters of neural networks uh, to, uh, to see this variability. Okay. But I agree, it's, uh, it's really an expensive thing to do, but it's if you want to have a confidence uh, bounds on what you're predicting, that's one way of uh, doing it. Go Bayesian. Other questions? Uh, I also have a probably naive question. So I don't, I'm not familiar with this BN, uh, Bayesian neural network. Uh, do you mean that in this com in this case, people are doing samplings or optimizations? So no, it's, really sa it's really about sampling. Okay. It's really uh, you you sample the the Bayesian measure. I mean this uh, theta parameter there. Uh, I mean you you'll be sampling those values of theta. So people are really interested in sampling this yeah. parameters of okay. Uh, it's actually a, a, a question that maybe has a simple answer, but I was just telling myself that maybe a, um area of application would be maybe not those huge spaces of neural network parameters, but uh, maybe smaller models, but for which the computation of the likelihood is very expensive. And so you want to minimize the number of evaluation of the likelihood you do. Mm. And so that could be another reason why you want to switch to uh, uh, mini batching. Have you explored this uh, at all? I mean, the thing is that uh, it's when the likelihood is expensive to compute, but can still be um, written as a sum over a large uh, number of uh, points. Well. Yes, which which uh, happens. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, so I mean, yeah. for, for sure, if you have an example in mind, I'm extremely interested. I uh, mean, I think in cosmology, this is what they have. They yeah. have super expensive uh, models to evaluate, and so they want sampling methods that will cost them uh, the lowest number of uh, of uh, evaluations they can. But the dimension in which they are is, uh, I don't know, 15 or. Uh, but no, I actually now I'm I'm not sure because do they have really a lot of data? Okay, I don't know. We should we should we should see. Okay, maybe maybe no. That's 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 true. They don't necessarily can. They sometimes they cannot even differentiate their okay. model. In which case, the indeed, conversation <laughs> stops uh, quite abruptly. Uh, then. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Fair point. Uh. Thanks, John. <laughs> no, no, but then it's a, it's more like a pseudo marginal uh, and so on, quoi. But it's more like Arnaud Doucet. Uh. <laughs> Tomorrow then. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> Um, any other question? Otherwise, let's thank Gabriel again. <laughs>